When we talked about the kinds of equilibria that might emerge in markets with asymmetric information, we identified two extreme types of equilibria that could emerge. One we call the pooling equilibrium, when no information is revealed and so everyone's treated the same within a single market. The other we call the separating equilibrium, where all information is revealed and separate markets emerge for each different type. Now we also said that in the real world we often see equilibria that have some of the features of a pooling equilibrium and some of the features of a separating equilibrium. Take health insurance markets for example. Health insurance companies would like to know all sorts of things about us that we have information about. Our lifestyle, what we eat, whether we exercise, our genetic predisposition to certain illnesses, our family history and so forth. But they can't get to that information. They can only observe certain of our characteristics, like our age. And they know the older we are, the more likely we are to engage in significant healthcare spending over the coming year. Now, that's not true for everyone. Their 80-year-olds are so healthy they're not even going to see a doctor over the coming year, and 30-year-olds with chronic diseases who'll have significant healthcare expenditures. But on average, it's a statistical fact that our healthcare spending increases as we age. So health insurance companies put us in different markets based on our age. That's the separating part of the equilibrium. But within each of those markets, we're treated the same, because the insurance companies have no additional information about our health risks that they can use to separate those markets even further. That's the pooling part of the equilibrium. And the older we get, the higher the premiums are that we're going to get charged. So insurance companies use the statistical fact that healthcare spending increases with age to charge higher premiums to older people. That's called statistical discrimination. So let me define that. Statistical discrimination is the use of statistical information about observable groups to infer something about individual members of those groups. So the insurance companies are using the statistical information about groups based on age to infer something about the health risk of individuals who are members of those different age groups. That's what we mean by statistical discrimination. Or think about life insurance markets. Life insurance companies also use age to statistically discriminate. For obvious reasons, the older we are, the more likely we are to die sooner. Not true for everyone. There are some 70-year-olds who are going to live for another 30 years, and some 40-year-olds who are going to die within the next decade. But on average, the older we are, the more likely we are to die sooner, and so the higher risk we impose on the life insurance company. But they also have separate tables, based on age, for different types of people. Smokers. have to pay higher life insurance premiums than non-smokers because it's statistically true that the more we smoke, the shorter a life we're likely to live. It's not true for every smoker. Some smokers live to a ripe old age and some people die in their 50s without ever having picked up a cigarette. But on average, the lifespan of smokers is shorter than the lifespan of non-smokers. And they have separate tables based on gender. Women pay lower life insurance premiums than men of a similar age. That's because women on average live longer than men. And so insurance companies statistically discriminate against men because men are statistically more likely to die earlier than women. So each of those is a case of statistical discrimination. And notice what's required. The insurance companies don't have enough information about individuals 
to price policies based on the individual characteristics. So instead, they use group differences. So you have to be able to observe group differences to statistically discriminate. And that kind of discrimination doesn't just happen in insurance markets. Think, for example, about labor markets. Suppose that you're an employer who's recruiting for a job where you hope to have an employee for a long time because you can invest a lot in that employee. You have two equally qualified applicants. One is a man and the other is a woman. You have to choose between them. Now, there's one statistical fact that might become important, and it does become important in real-world labor markets. Women are statistically more likely to leave the labor force for some extended period of time to have and raise children or even to take care of an elderly parent. That's simply true as a statistical fact as an average for women as opposed to men. Now, I, as the employer, know nothing about the individual characteristics of the male and the female applicant. For all I know, the male applicant is intending to take extended family leave in order to focus on his family. And for all I know, I know the woman is so laser focused on her career that she doesn't even intend to have any children. But I don't know any of that, and I'm legally not allowed to ask her. So I might end up statistically discriminating based on the observable group statistics that tell me that women on average are more likely to leave the labor force for extended periods than men. I might be wrong in this particular case, but I'll be right on average more often than I'm wrong. That's another form of statistical discrimination based on gender, just as we saw statistical discrimination based on gender against men in life insurance markets. Or we can see statistical discrimination based on race. In the life insurance market, until the 1960s, there was another set of tables where race was used to differentiate in terms of premiums. African Americans, for reasons related to the sordid history of discrimination in the United States and around the world, have on average shorter lifespans than white Americans. So life insurance companies priced premiums for African Americans higher than they did for African Americans than they did for whites, just as they price premiums higher for men than they do for women. Now, they may also have been racially prejudiced and have done it for other kinds of reasons, but they would have argued, look, we're doing exactly the same thing with race as we're doing with gender, as we're doing with smokers and with age. We're statistically discriminating. We're using information about groups to infer something about individuals. Now, I said life insurance companies did that until the 1960s, because the 1964 Civil Rights Act made it illegal to discriminate based on race, even if that's statistical discrimination. So we can see that statistical discrimination can emerge in all sorts of ways when we can't tell enough about individuals, and so we use group differences to infer something about individuals and then use that to discriminate. Some of that discrimination we don't find offensive at all. No one has any problem with life insurance companies charging smokers higher rates than non-smokers, or even charging different rates based on age. But we do have a problem charging different rates based on race, and so we made that illegal. The gender discrimination in labor markets we just talked about is statistical discrimination, but we find it sufficiently objectionable for that to have become illegal. Now, the mere fact that it's illegal doesn't mean it doesn't still happen. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that it still does happen. But the bottom line here is that as long as we can't get to the individual characteristics that we think are important for us to make decisions, we might often use group differences to infer something about individuals and then engage in statistical discrimination.